later, a lot of focus on the kind of most awkward moments in the public spotlight. When you were foreign minister or prime minister, what was your most awkward moment overseas? Well, it's full of um, stuff behind the scenes, which um, thankfully never makes the light of day. Um, <laughs> and uh, I remember I thought uh, recently about uh, uh, Julia's experience in India. I've had something almost like that as well. Uh, we were on a state visit to Germany. And uh, we've been flying for however long, government aircraft, uh, to Berlin. And uh, of course we've come from some crazy encounter somewhere. It was on the plane, off you go, sleep, get up, shower, and off you go. And uh, you folk work around the world, you know exactly what, what that's like. So I've done all that, slept. That recently well. And um, <coughs> coming in over Germany, shower, change, put on a uh, crisp, clean white shirt, new suit. Where are my shoes? <laughs> like, we could not, as we taxied in, we could not find my shoes. <laughs> <laughs> there is an honor guard out there. All these German soldiers and bands and people doing this, and I did not have shoes. Like I've been asleep for quite a while, but you don't actually carry around in your immediate kit your spare pair of shoes, do you? Well, sorry, I don't. <laughs> and uh, so some very diligent member of my staff had tied it away somewhere, and no one could quite remember who. And uh, they had just literally disappeared. They'd been put away somewhere safe. So this aircraft of ours is slowly manoeuvring towards the red carpet, and I'm there, looking pretty flash, but with no shoes. I've got socks, but no shoes. Uh, this is an issue. Uh, that's where your staff actually come in. So everyone lines up, and we work out who's got the approximate shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew Charlton, my then senior economic advisor, who's a brilliant guy, uh, and did so much of the behind the scenes work for me on uh, the G20 and Australia's succession. Terrific guy. And uh, <clears throat> now looking for West Farms. Uh, uh, he's uh, about two inches taller than I am, but he had the best approximation of a pair of shoes that would fit. But really, Larry, I mean, these shoes are kind of, you know, out there, Elvis 60s, you know, <laughs> form, you know get, getting a bit sharp. And uh, for that, anyone's going to fit. I put these things on. And I just feel like a mug layer. <laughs> and so then, then the band strikes up, the soldiers are there, and there I am coming out with some daggy helpers. <laughs> I just kept looking up, so no one else would look down. So, yeah, we've all been through these things. Okay. So, so the lesson is when you're a prime minister, your footwear matters. Footwear matters, pretty much. A spare pair of RMs from the UK. Good thing about RMs, by the way, not that I am uh, out here walking for RMs, but. Um, uh, you can wear RMs anywhere. So if you're in some uh, godforsaken country in the middle of a famine, your RMs work. If you're at Buckingham Palace, RMs work. You know, no one actually bothers. So RMs are universal trade for anyone in the diplomacy business. Kevin, I saw Bob Carr the other day saying that the Burmese foreign minister had said to him that Burmese people see Australians as Asians. What was the most interesting perception of Australia that you gleaned from a world leader or a foreign minister? The most interesting perception on their part towards Australia or just generally? Yeah, on their part towards Australia, whether it was wrong or right. I think what I'd say, partly back to what Bob has said, is that in the last 20 years we've actually travelled a long way as a country. Um, then the debate uh, way back then in the Mesolithic period uh, was about uh, uh, whether we were, quote, part of Asia. I rarely hear that debate these days. I think it's gone. Um, and it's no longer a question of 
ethnicity, for goodness sake, look at the contemporary face of Australia, we are everybody. And thank God we're everybody, we come from everywhere. And uh, the only people, people who don't are Indigenous Australians. So what I have found, and I can't pinpoint a single conversation, but I do notice the change in texture that uh, by the time I finished as Foreign Minister earlier this year, uh, there was almost a universal exception, acceptance of the fact that this is our hemisphere, this is our part of the world, this is who we are in all of its complexity, and we are on the bus. If you want one concrete symbol of it, for the first time this year, and I spent a lot of work on this, uh, the Prime Minister will attend a meeting of the uh, Asia-Europe uh, Forum, which is a head of government and the foreign ministry, foreign minister level, occurs every two years. For the first time we will be there, not in the undecided class, uh, on the side. They used to have us and the Russians. They didn't know where to put us. <laughs> us and the Russians. Good day, Igor. Good day, Kevin. <laughs> no problems. I don't know where to put us. Russia, Eurasia, and Australia, well, out there. So it's all fixed. The neighbourhood's happy. We now face all the Europeans on the Asian side. First time this year. Now, that's been a process of evolution over a long period of time. And that tourism wasn't getting the attention in the media and by policymakers <coughs> as it deserves. Um, firstly, do you agree with that? And what do you think is stopping that if you do agree with it? Well, in terms of public attention in the media, um, that's your problem, uh, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I answer for the political class here, there's no you answer for the media class. Um, but uh, last time I looked, we don't mandate the quantity and quality of media coverage on any subject. Uh, there's a few countries where they do. Uh, it's, it's interesting, and it's always more organised. Uh, uh, as Harry, Harry Truman once said, if you want an efficient government, uh, then uh, get yourself a dictatorship. Um, but. Um, Figures uh, in terms of the significance of tourism as exports for Australia and the domestic industry are huge. I know that coming from the People's Republic of Queensland. Uh, you know, for us, it's always been bread and butter. Um, I think uh, where collectively the nation needs to uh, lift its game is as follows. And some work, good work has been done on this. But to really hop inside the mind of Chinese tourists for the next 20 years and what they want, where they want to go, how they want to go, with whom do they want to go, how long do they want to go. Uh, this will be huge. And you know the size of the emerging Chinese middle class. Um, the services industries across the board are going to explode. So our exports of health services, financial services, medical services, um, uh, engineering services, design services, construction services, and tourism services. It's where so much of the future growth of the China trade is going to go. So, getting your airline services right, and I had something critical to say about our friends in Qantas on this subject when I addressed the Queensland uh, Tourism Industry Council a couple of months ago about that our access to you know, Qantas routes uh, into China, and I know they're doing stuff about that. Secondly, understanding that the Chinese tourists, when they come here, are like Japanese tourists on their first visit in the early 70s. And it is wrapping our mind around that and multiplying it by 10 and getting ready. That would be my broad answer to your question. The extent to which that's affecting the focus of national conversation, I don't know. I think uh, the most recent white paper um, uh, hangs a lantern on that as being an important um, area for investment in the future languages and culture and respect are key to that. Do you think there's a danger that people are starting to talk about Asia but uh, as a cinema re replace Asia with China and perhaps forgetting Indonesia and India along the way? The great thing about Asia um, is um, this has just been a term of geographical convenience uh, imposed on that vast complexity to our north and northwest by a bunch of Europeans several hundred years ago. Uh, Asia, if you take back to its uh, Latin roots, means the east. Okay, we're in the west, but in the east. I mean, imagine the Indonesians and the Indians 500 years ago and the Chinese saying, well, yeah, we're in the east. Yeah, we'll call ourselves Asia. It's got nothing to do with their own self identity. They see themselves as Balinese, they see themselves as Javanese, and Latinese, Indonesians. Um, they 
see themselves as as um, as uh, Indians. They see themselves as Hindus. They see themselves as Japanese, Koreans, Chinese. Often the thing which unites what's called Pan-Asian consciousness is nothing that is actually internally necessarily common with those cultures and civilizations. It's this. It is a common and collective negative experience of Western colonialism. Yeah. Okay? If you look, what's the one thing that unites the disparate cultures that I just mentioned? One thing that unites them is they got colonized by everybody at some stage or other. And frankly, we need to be always sensitive to the fact that when we roll up there and we say, we're from Australia, we've colonized nobody, it's quite a difficult breakthrough to cause uh, our friends in the neighborhood to conclude that uh, this bunch of, uh, of Europeans transplanted uh, to Australia represent a different view of the world to their colonial masters, which is whom they experienced in very bad circumstances for several hundred years. Do you think that still affects some of our relationships in Asia? I think historically it has, and I think we've got to give due difference to our forebears uh, and the work that they did when it was much more problematic. As I said, in the last 20 years, I think the great debates have been resolved. I mean, for example, can you imagine after all that uh, appalling colonial experience, uh, the hands of the Dutch in Indonesia, the hands of the French in Indochina, the hands of the British in India, and that we really intelligently <coughs> then trump, triumph, trumpet this thing called the white Australia policy. So, you know, we're a, we're a bunch of people uh, who haven't colonized anybody, but we go out and say, uh, but we only have white migrants. We sat with that for three quarters of a century, bipartisan support, my party, and conservatives. That did huge structural damage, but we are now beyond that. And the changing multicultural face of Australia is now increasingly known uh, in, uh, in uh, the neighbourhood. One of the fascinating things about the United Nations Security Council did was when we had lots of uh, foreign ambassadors come to Australia uh, to basically just explain them who the hell we are. The thing that they stunned them was the ethnicity on our streets. But they just saw us as a subset of the Angus uh, from afar, albeit a more progressive subset of the Angus than they've known in the park. And they come here and they just see the diversity. It's a, it, is, it, it, is, it literally blew their minds away. Uh, someone should mention this to Mr. Abbott about the Angus It's not a good term to use about Australia's future. It doesn't get us anywhere, even though that's the term he's used. On Asian languages, this is not exactly a new idea. It's been proposed uh, for a long time now. Do you think we're really realistically going to see the goals that are being set? I know in the speech you gave, you're talking about uh, front desks and hotels having uh, Mandarin speaking, for example, um, receptionists. Do you think that that's realistic in the state of the Cayman Let me give you a really good positive Australian story about this. Um, Shanghai Expo. Um, Cabinet thought I was mad at the time, but I was determined and that um, the fact that despite the fact that no provision had been made by the outgoing Howard government to fund our participation in the Shanghai World Expo in 2010, um, that um, we had to be there. If you were serious about the China relationship, you can't just say, sorry, we don't do expos. Um, and that meant being serious about an Australian pavilion. In the end, I think it cost us about $65 million. Um, so, uh, from our perspective, this was an outstanding success in Australian branding in that part of China. You know what really worked for us, part of the branding? We had a whole bunch of Aussie kids aged um, uh, 18 to 28 with pretty good Mandarin uh, out there. And as the queues formed each day to come and visit the Australian video, these Aussie kids would walk up and down the lines and crack jokes uh, with all the Chinese folks uh, waiting to come in. We're capable of doing that. We're capable of doing that. And in that particular expo, it was a stunning success. I actually saw it at work. So, apply that across the entire nation, what's possible. I first wrote a report on Asian languages and Australia's economic future in 1995. I was commissioned to do that by Paul Keating, the <coughs> Prime Minister. I was then Cabinet Secretary in the Queensland State Government. And if you look at that report uh, written back then, the thematics have continued. But I think two things have failed us. One, there must be absolute continuity of funding for this into the future. If you don't fund it, it won't work. <coughs> Would you be pleased to see that Tony Abbott's committed to an idea like that too? Yeah, I would, because um, the, the factual reality is that we agreed as a nation to the strategy in 1995. 
we funded as a nation, Labor and Liberal governments take the federal together between 1996 to 2002. In 2002, the Howard government pulled the plug on it entirely. And the whole thing, frankly, fell to the ground. When we're elected, we actually reconstituted funding in 2008. But you can't do that with a year on year, year one to year 12 system in the schools. You can't just withdraw funding for six years and imagine that it's all going to somehow sort itself out again. Second thing we need to do is lift our aspirations. Learning a foreign language is hard. It's not easy. And becoming an engineer is not easy. It's hard. Uh, graduating in the law is not easy. It's hard. So we need to actually respect folks who do this. And as I said in the fin the other day, in response to the white paper, how about the BCA? And I spoke to Tony Shepard about this, who heads the BCA, and said, what does the BCA, the top Australian 100 firms, say to the nation, each year, each of us will take on 10 bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, uh, fluent language speakers from the region. You can then go around this at the nation, and so we've got 1,000 first-class jobs waiting for you in the best companies in the country. You know what that does? It exercises a demand factor, which people know is going to happen in the future. We can't see these languages as sort of optional pieces of marginalia. They're actually central to the project, because when I travel through China, what does it say? They find it cute that I speak Chinese. But at a much deeper level, they actually see it as a sign of respect that you've made the effort to understand how an entirely different culture thinks. I know you're a fan of architecture. Um, Travelling overseas, obviously, the things that um, attract visitors, and I think James Packer made this point this morning, is it's not always necessarily the natural attractions. It's, it's casinos. It's, um, <laughs> <laughs> I won't use that term, but uh, he, did, he did suggest that it was, it was, it, it was more man-made um, structures that might attract people despite what may be inside them. Do you think it's time for Australia to start considering how we brand ourselves as a new country that doesn't have medieval castles and churches to sell to people? Do you think it's time to start looking at building opera houses uh, Something significant like that around our cities. I think uh, when you um, hop inside the mind of the world looking at Australia, it's quite interesting uh, what pops up. Um, um, people uh, think of Australia, in Europe at least, as distant, exotic, uh, full of wildlife, uh, friendly people. Um, and they're always surprised when they arrive here that there are a couple of large cities as well. Um, the folk in the region uh, actually have a not dissimilar view. So on the question of branding Australia, uh, what does a brand mean? It means different things to different people. Um, but I think, uh, don't underrate the fact that uh, when the world sees Sydney Harbour Bridge and the Opera House, they actually see the brand. You know why? Because they all watch New Year's Eve and we start it. And we start it with a bang. And whoever started that in Sydney, they should you know, get an order of Australia because it's a huge part of our global branding. But on top of that, I think um, when I travel around uh, Europe and Asia these days, there is a distinctive, um, shall I say, set of new iconic buildings being put up which are in completely new and modern style. I land in Brisbane or Melbourne any day. <laughs> Um, for different reasons. They managed to think that's a pretty good thing to have the Domestic National Terminals together in one building. Uh, frankly, I think that's pretty smart. Uh, in Brisbane, they didn't quite get that far, um, but it's pretty close. Um, Sydney, I came in the other morning from, uh, from London. Uh, I was talking in China, uh, sorry, in the um, UK giving some lectures on China last week. And I was actually talking to the guys from Customs as we just and I looked at the, um, the queues and the two major arrival halls, I think I'm right about that, mm -hmm. and uh, I said, okay guys, what's it like? This bloke said to me, said, we are the only airport in the world which manages to think that you can suddenly funnel four lines of people into one. <laughs> he said, uh, obviously there's a great wisdom in this somewhere, but it don't work, mate. And um, so, frankly, it's the gateway. Frankly, it's probably better. Um, I understand the complex intersection of interest in terms of who owns the place, investment, all the rest of it. But frankly, we need to do better in 
terms of uh, the principal national government. Yeah. And people do not like that level of cure. Yeah. Um, yep. And frankly, we need to be better at our protocol for these things too. People, I'm not saying that people at the desks are, are, are bad. They're terrific, in my experience, the, um, the uh, customs and immigration stuff. But in terms of making sure that people do not have to wait for ever a day, we should always have as our global benchmark, never be like LAX. Right? <laughs> bad equals LAX. Okay? Never trend in that direction. <laughs> in terms of how long you got to wait and the rest of it. That's pretty low on your scale. <laughs> oh, well, it's constrained by the real estate. I understand that. Um, but, um, but that's in terms of runway space. Given the real estate, you can't be better with the terminal space. I understand the difficulties of transition. You're building something new, you've got to actually run an airport at the same time. But we need a better national gateway than we got. So you recently, uh, Standard Aviation, gave Qantas the third. You mentioned that earlier. Do you, do you see the market by itself plugging those gaps, or does Qantas need a bit of a shove? Well, I met um, um, a Qantas CEO this morning, actually, on the, uh, and he was here. And uh, we just bumped into each other. And um, I said, um, I've had a few things to say about uh, how you service the China market four Chinese carriers servicing Australia at the moment, um, uh, Air China, China Eastern, China Southern, and Hainan Airlines, and, and Qantas. And as of 2012, if I want to go to Beijing, I cannot fly to Beijing <coughs> with Qantas. I just can't. Um, unless you want to uh, go through some uh, stopover in Shanghai, and I think you don't get Qantas on the second leg. I don't think you do anyway. yeah. um, when I was a kid working in the embassy 30 years ago, I could get Qantas all the way. I was there for the inaugural flight in 1984. Um, I think China's more important to us now than it was then. I think that's a reasonably sustainable argument. So my question to our friends from Qantas is, um, some bold steps of faith need to be taken here, I think. Because I think a lot of the Chinese trade um, actually are looking for uh, quality airline services uh, as, uh, as well. I know the Chinese are tough customers, the Civil Aviation Administration of China. I know Beijing Airport are tough customers. I don't minimize the difficulties here. But airlines need more than just a cost cutting strategy. They need a growth strategy. I'm not saying Qantas doesn't have one. The decision with Emirates is good. It's headed in the right direction. But in this hemisphere, the Asian hemisphere. Um, we have to be bolder uh, in how we service the future demands of our already number one trading partner. Now we all know that uh, the fiscal situation is fairly tight in Canberra, um, but there have been, I think, several calls, including a report that came out this week, a bipartisan one, saying that we need more consular services overseas, we need a better visa processing application systems, do we have the funds for that, and uh, how critical would you uh, prioritise that in, in your mind? Well, I've um, been pretty clear about these things before. Uh, in the first three years of the government, uh, we, if you look at the graph, we actually arrested the decline. Uh, and since then, we've had uh, our own budget challenges uh, because of the rolling impact of GFC on public revenue. Um, if I was trying to put this in a historical space, uh, what happened, uh, this is not to blame others for our current circumstances, but when I was a kid joining the Foreign Service um, back in the Mesolithic period, um, the, uh, our uh, diplomatic consular staff, there were more of them then than there are now. And I think you'd agree over the last 30 years, our global engagement is much bigger. The number of Australians travelling is much bigger. We have a million Australians offshore at any given time. Now, on any given day, a percentage of them are going to get into strike. And our job is to go and bail them out or do the best we can. So, in the, um, the down years, the problem was, uh, Alex always thought he was um, going to um, outrival um, uh, Costello as a uh, fiscal conservative. So every time a cost-cutting regime came across government, there was no special argument 
for what is actually a pretty small department, the Department of Foreign Affairs, in terms of its total budget, and less than a million. Um, that's before you go to the aid, the aid budget. Um, so you saw year on year, frankly, the, the, the number of personnel going down and down. What we did the first three years was tick it up just a bit, and then since then it's been hit again because of the state of budget. As soon as we have um, recovery uh, in the global economy and revenues begin to flow more effectively in coffers, this must be a top priority. The Foreign Minister I commissioned one piece of research of all G20 countries in the world, of which we are now one. We have the smallest foreign service of them all. And we are the 12th largest economy in the world. We have the smallest number of posts and the smallest foreign service of any of the G20 countries. And think about it. We are one of the most isolated countries geographically in the world. It doesn't make sense. And the stream of critique over so many years that diplomats have been high on the hog, and it's just a glamorous lifestyle. Some of the folks I've been in the field just doing permanently ugly stuff, visiting Australians in prison in Phnom Penh and God knows wherever else. I mean, these are a very dedicated bunch of people, highly professional. We should actually value them as a national asset, like we value the ADF. They're doing a whole lot of stuff in the front line, and a lot of it pretty ugly. All of it interesting, that's why they do it, but some of it pretty ugly and we need more of them. It's very fashionable for politicians to say when we have the, the, the fiscal situation we should prioritise this. There are so many competing prior priorities already and so many competing aspirations when the budget does come back into that situation. Uh, how critical is this one? If, if you're saying we should value our uh, diplomatic services like the ADF, isn't it more critical than some others? I take a pretty conservative view of these things, which is to say, what is the business of government all about? It's a hierarchy of things. What's the core responsibilities of government? The core responsibilities of government is to maintain the security of the state. That means domestically, um, police services and emergency services. Internationally, it means a defence force to defend the uh, territorial integrity and uphold the political sovereignty of the country. And it means, as part of that, um, your international uh, voice to ensure all of the above. So for me, if you're doing, you know, we've all studied Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this is, this is right at the very core of it. It's right at the very base of it, of what the state should be doing. Other things are important, but unless we are secure in our place in the region and the world, everything else becomes relative. And my argument is that our intelligence services, our diplomatic services, and our security services, including the ADF, are part of baseline reality. We need to do better. Well, we've run out of time, I'm afraid, but um, Kevin, thank you very much for joining us and talking to us. Mm. And uh, Anne, thank you for having us. Thank you. Absorbed, so um, lost my part in this whole thing. But uh, thank you, the taker, because I.